Prepare yourself for the terror. The prison of madness where few enter and none return. Welcome to Unsung Horrors. With Lance. And Erica. Leave all your sanity behind. It can't help you now. Welcome to another episode of Unsung Horrors, the podcast where we discuss underseen horror movies, specifically those with fewer than 1,000 views on Letterboxd. I'm your co-host Erica, joined by co-host Lance. Hey, everybody. And we are joined today by a very special guest. He is the director of the American Genre Film Archive, the founder of Bleeding Skull, and the host of Terror Tuesdays and Video Vortex at Alamo Draft House here in Austin. Welcome, Joe Ziemba. Thank you, Erica and Lance. It's nice to be here, and thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, for folks who are unfamiliar with uh, AGFA or Bleeding Skull, or maybe have heard the names but just don't know everything that y'all do, can you tell our listeners about those organizations? Oh, of course. Yeah, happy to. Um, so AGFA, it stands for the American Genre Film Archive, and we're a small nonprofit here in Austin, Texas. Um, that's actually the largest genre film archive and distributor in the world, although we are a very small team of five. Um, so it's myself, um, Alicia Coombs, who's head of business affairs, Sebastian Del Castillo, who is head of film preservation, Ivan Paycheff, who is head of the film archive, and uh, Brett Berg, who is head of theatrical sales at AGFA. So the five of us kind of uh, do everything at AGFA. And um, we started out as just a film archive with lots of prints. We have over 5,000 film prints in the archive. And from there, grew into a theatrical distributor. And so we do theatrical distribution for a lot of our home video friends and labels like Shout Factory, Arrow, Vinegar Syndrome, Severin, many, many others. And um, we also branched out uh, a few years ago into our own home video releases and Blu-ray releases. And that has actually gotten a, a lot more part of our, our mission since the pandemic started, since theaters closed. So we had to pivot very quickly mm -hmm. and um, work more in that vein. Bleeding Skull is a, a site that I started in 2004 because I um, had a passion for obscure horror movies that I felt weren't getting their due in the world. There were, you know, at the time, So Bad It's Good was very prevalent and even more so now, I think it's even worse. Mm -hmm. But um, Bleeding Skull was kind of like at war with that sentiment of things being so bad they're good. And so I, I sought to uh, you know, give voice and celebration to movies that I felt were not getting uh, what they deserved in the world. So from being a site for a few years, it grew into um, our first book, um, which is Bleeding Skull, a 1980s trash horror odyssey that came out in 2013, and then um, grew into a uh, releasing label with our friends at Mondo that we did for a few years, and we did some limited edition DVD and VHS releases. Um, and then our second book is coming out um, in June with Fanagraphics, June of 2021, and it's called Bleeding Skull, a 1990s trash horror odyssey, and that was written by myself, Annie Choi, and Zach Carlson at Bleeding Skull. And then we also collaborate with AGFA to release AGFA and Bleeding Skull Blu-rays. And the distinction between those is that the Bleeding Skull Blu-rays are the movies that were shot on video or edited on video, so they're not actually film films. And so the 1990s uh, horror trash odyssey, that's coming out in June, you said, right? Yeah, it should be June. It actually finally went to press right before the week before Christmas. Mm -hmm. So um, it's either June or July. It just depends on you know when they get the copies in and when it's ready. But it's finally happening. It's been a, a five year process. Awesome. To get that book nice. Out. Yeah. 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 And awesome. if anybody doesn't have the first book, and if you can find a copy, definitely pick it up because it's great. Head yeah. Press uh, has it available on their website, but it's a UK company. So, but yeah. it's it's cheaper than you know. And also, don't give money to Amazon if you don't have to. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Headpress is, is great about shipping to the U.S. too. I still order books from Headpress. They're yeah. really fast. So, yeah. Yeah, they're is great. Is the new book up for pre-order yet, Joe? Um, it is. We haven't done a big announcement yet because it's not. It's just up on the Fanographics site, so you can pre-order okay. it from their site. But when it's finally in and we have copies, we're going to do a big, you know, obviously a big push for it and all, all sorts of fun stuff. Awesome. Oh, yeah. All right. We'll put links to where you can get the 1980s one on Headpress as well as where you can pre-order it. Thank you. Yeah, of course. So, um, and then getting back to AGFA, you, uh, you know, you talked a little bit about some of the collaborations that you do with like something weird and vinegar syndrome and you guys, you know, so this episode's coming out on the 20 episodes coming out on the 21st and you guys have uh, a new release 
coming out on the 26th. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we have we have two, in fact, in January. Yeah, we have uh, The Curious Dr. Hump, which is an Agfa and Something Weird release. And we have the Agfa Horror Trailer Show, which is an Agfa release. Um, both of those come out on January 26th. Awesome. I saw the the horror trailer show in theater in the in the before times. Is it the same one that was shown? Is yeah, it? yeah. Well, thank you for joining us at that screening, too. It was a lot of fun. That was the last big, great screening we did before yeah. everything happened. But um, yeah, so it's that show, and then there's also a bunch of extras on it. There's actually a whole additional mixtape called the Agfa Horror Trailer Show Video Rage, and it's all um, straight to video, direct to video, and shot on video trailers, like a mixtape of those. Awesome. And those are both going to be available through Vinegar Syndrome? Yeah, yeah. So Perfect. Vinegar Syndrome is is our uh, distributor. So their their parent company OCN distributes our Blu-rays. So yeah. Perfect. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, I will put links to where you guys can buy those as well in show notes, folks. So just give all your money to Agfa this month. All right. So in addition to all of these amazing things that Joe is a part of, he is also my inspiration for this episode's movie pick because he brought this movie to Terror Tuesday a couple years ago. Uh, So my pick is a movie called Crystal Eyes or Marada de Cristal from 2017. Uh, now, as of this recording, it is available to watch on the Arrow Video Channel, which you can sign up for a free 30-day trial or subscribe for $4.99 a month. Uh, and you can also rent the movie on iTunes. And then as of this recording, it has 283 views on Letterboxd. And then hopefully there'll be quite a few more after listening to our episode or before in preparation for our episode. So I'm going to give a mostly spoiler-free summary, but we are going to get into some spoilers later in the discussion, so please keep that in mind. Uh, It is a giallo. It is a murder mystery. You are going to want to watch this before listening. Even if it does get spoiled for you, though, it is there's a lot to to see and wonder at in this movie, so uh, still worth it even if we if even if you decide to not watch it before listening. So. Uh, The movie opens in 1980s Buenos Aires during a fashion show for the magazine Attila. Supermodel Alexis Carpenter is getting drunk and starting cocaine backstage, uh, along with insulting pretty much everyone around her. She throws a very hot cup of coffee in the face of her makeup artist before storming out onto the catwalk. And then she brazenly drinks a bottle of champagne right on the catwalk, which spills down onto the electrical panel beneath which results in her getting electrocuted. One year later, the magazine Attila is organizing a photo shoot to honor the late Alexis and her legacy on the anniversary of her death. But on the night before the shoot, Alexis's dresses go missing, stolen by her brothers, Matthias and Herman, both of whom are presumably killed during the theft. And soon the magazine staff, including editor-in-chief Lucia and her twin assistants, and models chosen for the issue are picked off one by one by a knife-wielding assailant dressed in a black rain slicker and a living doll slash mannequin-esque mask. So this film was written and directed by Ezekiel Endelman and Leandro Montejano, who also did the production design on the film. Uh, and so, Joe, I wanted to turn it over to you for a bit here so you can talk a little bit about how you discovered this movie, how you brought it to Terror Tuesday a couple of years ago, and any sort of information that you got after sort of chatting with the directors or production information you have about it. Yeah, and I'd like to point out that I, I appreciate the fact that you pointed out that Alexis was snorting cocaine yeah. in that section because it's all about the details with this movie, <laughs> and that's a, that's yes. a great detail. Um, <laughs> So this movie, um, Arrow, who you mentioned, every year they do a thing called Fright Fest in the UK that I think you mentioned at the top of this, mm-hmm. um, where they have their own festival where they introduce, there's some repertory stuff, but it's mostly new movies. And, um, you know, at AGFA, we're always checking out all the festivals because we want to see what's out there and, and find out, you know, is there anything that maybe we want to, you know, promote or, or rep in movie theaters, but we're always checking those. So Fright Fest that year, I saw this movie called Crystal Eyes, and I was taken by the image that was on the site, and it was the the mannequin mask, like the killer Mm -hmm. itself. And I love a good mask in a slasher movie. That's like all it'll take to get me to watch it if it's like a a photo of a really great mask in a slasher. So I was kind of uh, taken in by that photo, and I was looking everywhere to see, you know, where was this movie? Because at that point, it was almost a year after it had played, maybe. And um, I couldn't find it anywhere or any record of it being available to watch. 
So I reached out to our contact at Arrow and asked them, what is the deal with Crystal Eyes? And she immediately put me in contact with the directors. Um, and I was able to get a screener link to watch the movie. And that's how I discovered it. It was pretty straightforward. But um, usually, I would say 75% of the time when you reach out about a, an indie horror movie that looks cool and you end up watching the screener, it's um, not all it's cracked up to be, not mm -hmm. what you hoped it would be. But I was um, really pleasantly surprised by Crystal Eyes um, and, and really into it when I first watched it. There was something special going on with the movie. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So I got the screener. And then typically, so the formats for showing things in theaters, there's, you know, you can show things on a 35 millimeter print. Um, but the preferred format for digital, uh, for restorations is it's called a DCP. Mm -hmm. And um, I asked them, you know, is there a DCP that we can show? And there wasn't. They only had a Blu-ray copy that they'd use for festivals. And um, the Alamo is pretty strict around that time about what formats that we were able to show on screen. So we could have done a Blu-ray, but DCP is like the best way to do it and, you know, the most prob problem-free and it'll look best on screen. It's actually made, you know, to be seen on a movie screen. Mm -hmm. So they were nice enough to give us the master file for the movie and we created a DCP at AGFA so that we could screen it at Terror Tuesday. Awesome. Yeah. Lance missed it. By the way, I did. That was one of the very few I missed that year. <laughs> I'm sorry you couldn't be there. <laughs> I still haven't seen it. I don't even know why I'm here on this episode. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, thank you for sharing that. That's that's really awesome, and I'm glad you had the chance to bring it uh, to Terror Tuesday for us. Oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Me too. Um, so this film um, has a lot of actors in it, but most of them only have a single credit, and that's this movie. And I apologize here in advance for uh, mispronouncing anybody's name, um, but those actors include Enahi Politi as Eva, Erica Boveri as Irene, and both of those are the two models who have been selected for the anniversary edition, Claudio Arnesto as Anton, Valerie Giorcelli as Barbara, Camilla Pizzo as Alexis Carpenter, Diego Benedetto as Matias, that's Alexis's, one of Alexis's brothers, uh, Nacho Hosas as Hernan Carpenter, and of course we have the twins Nadia and Nidia, played by Victoria Del Rosal and Augustina Del Rosal. There are a few veteran actors like Sylvia Montanari. She plays Lucia, the head of the fashion magazine Attila, uh, the female doctor at the end. So both of them have, you know, over 50 acting credits, mostly television, specifically soap operas, um, which we'll talk about when we get into our discussion of the film. Um, I'm not going to list them off for listeners as far as like specifics that she's been in, because unless you are up to speed on Argent Argentinian telenovelas, I think that would kind of fall on deaf ears there. But just because it doesn't have people that you know, and it doesn't mean that it's not worth watching. So the score is done by Pablo Fue. Uh, I might be mispronouncing that. It's F-U-U, -U, uh, a.k.a. Paul Fu Manchu. Uh, he has a number of credits, though. He's done a series of short SOV films by an independent Argentinian company called Gore Vision. And they have a YouTube channel. And they're pretty much all spoofing um, or kind of knockoffs of popular cult movies like Videodrome, Scanners, uh, Zombie Apocalypse. Uh, and there's even a Star Wars one on there. And I know everyone's wondering... Yes, I did go down this rabbit hole and I did watch some of these, even though there were no subtitles and I don't understand Portuguese. So that was fun. Well, that, that's how you know you're a true warrior of getting into this stuff. When you start getting into movies without subtitles and you're like, you know what, I'm going to watch them anyways because yeah. I really want to see them. <laughs> I've done it a couple times for some Spanish and Italian movies and I, I can pick up enough words to sort of understand what's going on, but... If I'm watching something like that, I'm really just kind of watching it for the visuals and what the fuckery, because the scanners one was called uh, subtitled doppelgangers, and it, it involved a three-way with an invisible doppelganger, had lots of dildos, penis vision, had some borrowed gore footage, and of course the exploding head from scanners, but you know they stole it from scanners. They didn't make their own, but it's... It's it's fun, but uh, so that is a list of stuff. It's, there's some, wow. there's some things going on in there. <laughs> um, I will say that the Star Wars one, Star Wars Gore Tech, 
does have subtitles. So if you want to go down the Argentinian Gore Vision rabbit hole, they're all on YouTube. They have their own YouTube channel, like I mentioned. And you can hear some more of uh, Pablo's scores <laughs> in some of those. A lot of it's stolen, obviously. So <laughs> Borrowed, sorry. Change my verbiage on that. Borrowed, not stolen. Uh, and then finally, the cinematography uh, was done by Cecilia Casa and Venena Gotardi. So we'll get into more of the film, uh, including our thoughts about it, right after this promo from our network. You're listening to the Prescribed Films Podcast Network, home to hundreds of hours of free podcast entertainment. The shows on this network all have a common goal providing you with the best discussions about movies and other forms of entertainment media. The PFPN hopes to fill your ear holes with audio joy. Visit our website with links to all the other amazing shows at www.thepfpn.com. Thanks for listening. Joe, I'm going to start with you. So um, normally we just kind of talk about what are some of our favorite aspects of the film. So when you first watched it, what were some of the things that really stood out to you the most? Like what did you, what were some of your favorite aspects of it? I thought immediately right from when the movie starts to the, the entire thing, really, the production design and attention to detail is really exceptional in this movie. Mm-hmm. Um, there's everything is thought out. You know, there's miniatures in this movie and it's, mm-hmm. a, it's a low budget, micro budgeted, you know, giallo slasher movie. And it's easy to cut corners when it comes to making these movies because you know what people expect and they just expect gore and, you know, violence and, you know, typical tropes of these types of movies. But they really went above and beyond with this movie. And I, I really appreciated that. And that's what really sold it to me. Um, I, I like when people go the extra mile and look at details. And this movie to me was kind of like, if you've seen The Love Witch, the Anna mm-hmm. Miller movie, um, her attention to detail and creating an, an entire world basically by hand. Um, there's kind of a, a thrift store version of that in this movie. And I like that so much. I really like when the movie feels otherworldly and they can actually create their own other world within the movie. Um, that's the best. I love it, especially with low budget stuff. And they really went for it in this. And they also, you know, the video aesthetic that they used um, felt real. It didn't feel like a Premiere or Final Cut plugin that a lot of people use now when they want to, um, you know, this is VHS or this is shot on video. And it's like, it's just blurry and it glitches a little bit and it mm-hmm. looks like HD video and it doesn't look like it at all. But this movie was actually shot on what looks like actual video and it looks great and it really helps the feel of the whole thing. So I think it was all of that and it actually delivered in the end. You know, the movie, it's it's a little slow in the third act maybe, mm-hmm. but overall um, it's really fun. It's a valentine to 80s pop culture and horror and it keeps moving throughout the whole thing and um, it's campy and fun and there's laughs. It's a good time and it's sincere. Yeah. What I love about something like this, like you mentioned, is when someone has a limited budget and they're able to do so much with it and make it look so great. Like I think of like Mario Bava, Planet of the Vampires and the things he was able to do in that movie. And, you know, just being able to make it look so gorgeous. It's clearly made by two men who love this genre Mm -hmm. and, it's like you mentioned, it's fun. There's all these little Easter eggs in there um, for, for, you know, for fans of the genre too. Mm-hmm. So it's not even just like they're making it for themselves, but they're making it for fans of Gialli as well. Uh, Lance, what about you? Yeah. I mean, what you guys already set up the set decoration and, you know, like mad props to the set decorator and the location scout, like from the fashion house to the scenes of the models walking around town and to that inner city building where the final photo shoot is supposed to take place. It's just like everything comes together. And like what Joe said, it is very otherworldly. And to me, that otherworldly aspect, I know this was set in the eighties, but to me, it feels like a timeless period. Like it almost has a futuristic feel to it, like a Blade Runner vibe or something. Like it doesn't, Mm -hmm. I was never sucked into the eighties while watching this, uh, even though they do throw a lot of that at your face. Uh, But uh, along with like the, the set decorations and stuff is the, is that synth score, which, you know, right when it starts, you're just hit with that drone and it it just sets the whole tone for the entire film, which 
with the neon lighting, you know, it just, it, it puts you in that, that world and in that, in that vibe that, that works so well with it. Yeah. I, I love, I think if I had to pick a favorite, it would be Lucia's office. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's, it, I mean, the Suspiria room, let's just call it that. Like, <laughs> I mean, that's really what it is. It's, it's, or, I mean, we could call it the Argento room because, it, you know, I, I mentioned Easter eggs. There's a uh, crystal bird in there. There's, it's just all of the color is just like a room straight out of Suspiria. There was a white phone there. I mean, there's all these like little details, like, like Joe mentioned, like the cocaine and like all these little things. Like if you don't have a budget, you know, if you pay attention to the details, it it shows and it comes through and having a blind character, like, you know, whether it's an homage to either Fulci and um, that whole Irene set, death set piece, like a, the Gates of Hell trilogy, or if it's about, you know, the blind guy in Suspiria. There was another Easter egg that was mentioned on IMDb, which I did not pick up. And I've actually seen the movie that it's referencing. There's a Mexican film called um, Blacker Than the Night or Darker Than the Night from 1975, directed by Carlos Tab- Tabaoda. Um, I believe is his last name. And that has a black cat named Becker as well, just like uh, our main, uh, main character had. I didn't, oh. I didn't pick that up when I watched it. And I've seen that movie like recently. <laughs> so <laughs> You'd well, have going, to be like a, a mad genius to pick that up. Who would ever right. pick that up? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I mean, I don't even know if the directors intended that. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know, but I think one other thing that I, um, there's a few. I like that it's a very female dominated cast, I, I, which, you know, it makes sense in the, it, it, when you have something that's fashion centric, but when you look at other classic Gialli that are the sort of cosmopolitan fashion centric, like blood and black lace, that's not just female dominated. Like a lot of the characters in that are male. So it's very few men in this. And I mean, I like that about it. So. Yeah. And I think, um, I think it's there is a rela- somewhat related to that is that you know there's spoiler alert there's a trope in this movie um, at the end like the reveal of it that is clearly a variation from Psycho mm-hmm. and um, I think that a lot of that was kind of a trend in the '80s to kind of pull that um, that trope out <laughs> um, but I think all the movies that were made in the '80s that used that trope were usually by like old white men and um, I think that it's kind of almost uh, taking that trope back um, in a way with this movie and making it something that's a little more um, resonant in a way. And uh, I appreciated that too when I watched it because when that first came up and I was watching, I was like, oh no, what are they doing with this? And mm-hmm. then the way that it ended and what they did with it, I was like, oh, this is great. That's very cool what they did with it. Yeah. Well, yeah. One of the kill scenes too, it was uh, one of the twin sisters, Nadia and Nidia. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was Nadia's kill scene. It feels like an ode to Psycho too, because the mannequin pops up behind her while she's, you know, prepping herself in the in the mirror. And that kill scene, it's the 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 actual music is like drastically these repetitive notes that kind of sound and are reminiscent to the Psycho theme. While the mannequin holds this broken piece of mirror and just stabs, and the camera movement follows it like the Norman Bates slash. And that's that's kind of like what I got from that as well. A little bit of uh, ode to Psycho. Yeah, I, I, as much as like this is a giallo and uh, a love letter to that genre, there's so many other it's you know horror movie elements in it that that pop up just like that too, and and not even just horror movies because so the killer, um, which is you know what drew Joe to this movie in the first place, that mask, it's this mannequin mask and not just like the the mask itself being really interesting to look at but how it moves so it moves partly like a mannequin but also partly like and here's where i'm going to get super geeky like the weeping angels from doctor who who only move when you're not looking at them yeah i love those creepy how the mannequin just moves forward without seeing her move. You just, you cut to whoever she's chasing, cut back. It's, you know, kind of like red light, green light go. Yeah. It's awesome. It is. So Joe, when you introduced this movie at Terror Tuesday, you said, keep two things in mind, giallo and telenovela. Mm -hmm. And I was, uh, when you said that, I was like, Ooh, (laughs) how's this going to play? But Mm -hmm. when I watched it, I was like, 
This is so much fun. <laughs> I, I love those parts of it. And so what they'll do in the movie is they have these split screen flashbacks and they're overly dramatic and, and just, just fantastic. And so Lance, I wanted to uh, get your thoughts about the, the telenovela aspect of it and how that landed for you. Well, I, you know me. I, I always love talking about like old soap, soap operas and stuff. When yeah, it comes to Lance that. is a huge Another World fan, folks. Just if you're if you <laughs> well, haven't listened to previous, my stuff. parents watched As the World Turns and Days of Our Lives. Oh, that's up. right. So I, I'm familiar with a lot of those characters. <laughs> but yeah, some of the some of our past episodes, um, whenever there's this real, just a vibe of even the look of the filming, if it's a little hazy, that looks kind of like soap opera uh, episodes from you know the '80s. I'm just sucked in right away. And and this definitely had that aspect. You know, I, I missed that Terror Tuesday, so I didn't get to hear, you know, keep those uh, keep those ideas in mind while watching this. But those flashback scenes, I know exactly what we were talking about in the very beginning when uh, Lucia is talking to uh, uh, Eva and Irene about about how horrible of a, of a character Alexis Carpenter was to them. And it's just like, I, I don't know. I, I just, I love that the whole kind of, soap opera campiness vibe of it. But the main thing about this film is the, the the pacing that kind of threw me off. It's insane. I loved it. This thing is just under about 82 minutes, which is, you know, obviously extremely short, especially for a giallo, but it just packs a punch. I mean, the, dia- the, the dialogue is spit out like in record time to cram in everything necessary, but it doesn't feel rushed at all, especially the kill scenes, uh, specifically those Nadia and Nidia murder scenes where they just take their time you know, prep, preparing themselves with like, you know, curling their eyelashes, applying perfume and mm-hmm. the tension is built incredibly well. And, you know, the, the viewers just provided all these shots of the dead bodies in different angles. So they kind of really spend their time on, on these, I don't know, on these really dramatic scenes, uh, but they do rush through the moving the picture along. So, you know, it's never boring. It's just, it flies by like that. And it's, yeah. it's just so much fun to watch. Joe, you mentioned like the, like it kind of falls apart a little bit in the third act. What specifically do you think it, it's lacking there? Oh, I don't know if it falls apart. It, it slows down. It slows little bit. down. Yeah. Sorry. yeah when yeah. they're, um, when they're uh, searching around the big rooms in the, mm-hmm. I don't remember where they are. I haven't watched it since Terror Tuesday, so yeah. I don't remember exactly. But, um, you know, the, the big climax when they're inside, I think, I can't remember what kind of a building it is, but, you know, searching around the building, I think that's that's something that happens quite a bit in Low Budget Horror. It's searching, searching in the house, searching mm-hmm. the building, searching outside, you know, it happens. It's like, it's a thing. Um, but yeah, so, but it's, it, you know, like you said, it's only 80 minutes, so yeah. it doesn't really matter. Yeah, it is 80 minutes. It, do, it does move super quickly. But I think one of the reasons that it moves so quickly is that it doesn't have, a, it doesn't really have a central character or protagonist in this. Like, I, I know there's the main, there's like the two main models and one gets killed and then we're sort of following one of them for a while. So she's kind of the the central figure. But there's no one, there's also no one there that is trying to solve the murders either, because they all happen in one night and so quickly. <laughs> so it, it's it's a bare bones approach. But like Lance said, I don't really think it hinders the plot. It just lets you focus on the aesthetics and how fun it is. But yeah, I agree absolutely with Joe. There, There's a little bit, it slows down at the end when they, it, it's like a large mansion and they're having a fashion show in one of the large rooms there. And they're just sort of going through that house back and forth. Yeah. And there's like keys. It's like, who's got a key. I've got a key. Got <laughs> Ring the bell for the lady. And it, a little bit there, but it doesn't take away from, from the movie as a whole. I don't think. No. Yeah. It seems like everybody's like red. It's just red herrings galore. Like, like you said, there's no real central character because almost everybody that's presented as a potential killer is killed. Mm -hmm. So it just kind of keeps snowballing until you get to the, to the end and the reveal. And it's like, Oh yeah, this is classic Giallo where you're just pulling that guy from way back when. Yeah. From the very beginning of it. So spoilers for the ending. Um, I mentioned in the summary that Alexis had two brothers and they both went to steal the dresses that were meant for the fashion shoot and that they were both presumably killed. Um, so one of them, uh, her brother, 
Matthias is the killer in this. Um, so he is not killed in the beginning. You know, we just see him sort of scream and then we see the face of the, ma- we see the mask and we presume that he's been killed. But if you watch horror movies, you should know if you don't see a dead body, they're not dead. It's a blanket rule across every horror movie. And even if you do see a dead body, that's still not a guarantee because you could be in a zombie movie and you just don't know it. But so I, I did really like the the last death, though. I think that was probably my favorite with it was like the the flying the flying bird and then it flew into her back. Yeah. The, um, the- the it reminded me bird. not just of, yeah, the crystal. Yeah. I mean, it's a crystal bird, but it also <laughs> reminded me a lot of, Oh God, is it popcorn that I'm thinking of? Oh yeah, totally. The mosquito. Yeah. The giant yes. Mosquito. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Like, I mean, like Joe said, it's not just love letter to Giallo. It's got all these other like horror movie elements in there too. So I'd like to think, you know, the directors added that, that part into it as well. So, Oh, popcorn. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, and I think uh, the key to doing, because this is like a throwback movie, essentially, and I mm-hmm. think the key to making throwback movies successful is because there's so many of them now, I think is actually taking all of those influences and all those loves you have and then crafting a new kind of universe out of it. And I think this movie does a good good job of doing that. Yeah, they've they've created their own little universe. Like, it, And I agree with what Lance said it. It is. It does feel timeless, but it does. It does have a lot of like the '80s look to it, and I think a lot of that's mainly just the fashion and the hair and the makeup for me, and also the closing credit song, which is wonderful. And stick around to the end because that's our closing song for this episode. <laughs> <laughs> but also, there is a fantastic song in the very middle of the movie. <laughs> That's my favorite scene, for sure. <laughs> I figured. <laughs> it's so good. It's when uh, Eva's getting ready for the shoot to mm-hmm. go do that final shoot. And she's like painting her nails. And on this, you know, old TV, uh, there's this female singer who is just belting out this killer. I'm, I'm assuming it's an original song because the lyrics that are uttered, you know, involve crystal eyes. Some of the lyrics were incredibly cool and would work really well as like a Giallo title. I did write some of them down. Yeah, it's. Uh, I looked it up. It's Diana Maria La Fria Muñeca, or The Cold Doll, I believe that translates to, I think. Oh, the name of the song? Yeah. Could, yeah, because some of those lyrics, it was like The Cold Doll or The Crystal Eyes, The Dead People. Um, the Cold Doll was invited to dance. All those, I was just completely intrigued. And But during that scene, you know, while the singing, again, it's one of those uh, really really uh, just well-timed pacing uh, scenes that the, the, the directors pull in where it, they take their time on it and Eva has her black cat and she walks over to the to the window of her apartment and it's clearly a set design and that's mm-hmm. that's why I love it so much just the way it looks with the fake sky background and mm-hmm. uh, I was just like this is it this is and, and, and that singer is just like practically struggling for this long note she's carrying on it's just so good I think that is my second favorite set design piece of it. The miniature is, is my favorite. My miniatures are always my favorite. <laughs> yeah. So I think everyone can tell that we, you know, all really like this movie. We would all recommend it, but we, you know, you should always think about double feature recommendations. So uh, Joe, you're a guest. So um, if you were going to show this in a double feature, what would you pair this with and why? Well, thank you for letting me go first. That's nice of you. Um, I can't wait to hear what both of you have, actually. I'm excited, more excited for that, so I'm not going to talk very long. But, <laughs> um, my pick would be a, an actual movie from 1986, from the 80s, um, called Dream Maniac. One word, Dream Maniac, directed by David Dakota. And uh, this is an early shot and video slasher, and it's Dakota's first horror movie. It pairs well with this movie because, like Crystal Eyes, it has a very um, otherworldly, blurry video hangout mood piece kind of vibe to it, and there's lots of neon lights in it. It's uh, it's also yeah very hangout, like it's just like it is what it is. But um, David Dakota is uh, one of the few gay directors in the '80s making horror movies. It mm-hmm. was pretty rare back then, and so this movie is filled with lots of guys in whitey tighties 
being tied up and killed by the succubus and a lot of gratuitous male nudity. So it's quite refreshing for an 80s horror movie to have all this stuff in it. But I think the mood overall really fits well with Crystal Eyes, and it feels like they came from the same cloth, even though they're you know decades apart. But I would watch Crystal Eyes first, and then Dr- I would put on Dream Maniac like way after midnight when you're kind of like hazy and mm-hmm. kind of in between consciousness and just like, let, it, <laughs> let it flow through you like a dream. Love just it. like the title says. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, Lance, what about you? Uh, I'm going to pick the Swedish thriller Mannequin in Red from 1958. Uh, Written and directed directed by Arnie Mattson. Uh, This is actually considered by some to be a precursor of Italian giallo, uh, most notably Mario Bava's Blood and Black Lace. Uh, It's about a young model uh, who's murdered at a fashion house and a detective and his wife work together to find the killer. And there are actually a lot of similarities with Crystal Eyes. Um, You know, there's this murder top model other models wanted to kind of take reign of that top spot there's this insultingly dominant woman in charge who is just fantastic <laughs> um, and then there's like all these gawking fanboys that are just you know enamored with the model's beauty and their attitudes but even though it was released 60 years before crystal eyes it's a nice companion piece it focuses more on the mystery of the murders uh, than having a slasher element uh, it is really heavy on the dialogue a bit long-winded but it has some really fun, like Hitchcockian humor, and there are some really great kill scenes actually, with the death by fire scene and the super creepy image of a model hanged from a construction crane. Uh, and there's plenty of mannequins, <laughs> so <laughs> I would seek that one out. I couldn't find it streaming anywhere, and I'm hoping that there's someday, if there isn't already, an Arnie Matson uh, set that would be released. But I'd recommend seeking that one out. That sounds so good. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, I, I sent it to you and I haven't even watched it yet because I oh, couldn't get it. it to play on my TV. <laughs> <laughs> I, do, I do have, just a spoiler alert for extra for future episode picks, I do have an Arnie Matson uh, movie lined up that goes way more into horror. So okay. I'm kind of stuck on Swedish films right now. I'm, I'm 100% okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so for my double feature... I want to get the people in the door. So I'm going to put a well-known Giallo first build and then have Crystal Eyes to follow it up with. I know there are a lot of sort of fashion-centric Gialli that it could be paired with, like Blood and Black Lace, uh, Strip Nude for Your Killer, Red Queen Kills Seven Times, which I think all would work well with this. But I would, I, I would go with Argento's Bird with the Crystal Plumage. I think it would be a fun way to start. I think it would be fun to start with that and then follow with crystal eyes. And then you could sort of pick out some of the Easter eggs. You'd be like, Oh, look, there's the bird and you know, in the, in the office. And I know it's sort of like the obvious pick, but it's also one where I'm like, I want to draw people in to see it. And of course, Argento is going to be a big draw. So. Yeah. It doesn't matter if it's obvious when it's really great. Yeah. You know, exactly. I mean, it's like, Oh, I've got to watch our, you know, Argento. Yeah. (laughs) All right, so um, we've got Dream Maniac. We have Mannequin in Red or uh, The Bird with the Crystal Plumage. Or, I mean, fuck it, do a quadruple feature. Do all of them, you know? (laughs) All right, uh, Lance, February is the month of love. This is true. It is your pick first. What are we we watching for the next episode? Okay, so like you said... um, it is February, so the next this next episode comes out before Valentine's Day. And I wanted to pick something that, that would get all types of people into the spirit and mood of love, as destructive as it can be. So I'm going with the 1991 shot on video horror Dream Stalker, directed by Christopher Mills. Uh, with just over 300 views on Letterboxd, most people need to see this bizarre film. Dream Stalker is labeled a horror, but... It's a romance and a true love story at its core. We watch Ricky, a top motocross athlete, fall madly in love with his fiance, Brittany, who has a lot of strange dreams. But she's seen a Dr. Frisk to help her with these. Uh, Ricky is sadly killed during a motocross race, and Brittany begins to have dreams of Ricky coming back to life and killing those around her, particularly those who treat her bad. And we come to learn that these are not just dreams, but Ricky carrying out his undead love for the one he wants to be with forever. This is a great love story detailing how silly and how far people are willing to go for love. And I wanted to treat this pick like you would your Valentine. So there are things that you really, really love about it. 
but there are also some things that can be a little irritating. So watching this is, gonna, <laughs> is kind of like being in a relationship. Uh, and some, some may hate me for this, but in true Valentine's Day fashion, you have to pay to watch it. It's a buck ninety nine on Amazon Prime. Uh, Intervision I have a DVD release that you can pick up from from Severin. It's a double feature with the Texas uh, shot on video, Death by Love. Uh, or you can sign up for Flex Fling for the seven day trial and watch it that way. Uh, but keep in mind, this is a shot on video pick, so the sound is pretty rough. But there's <laughs> entertainment and appeal and and in all these types of movies. Uh, and Dream Stalker is definitely endearing. So. That's my gift. That's my Valentine's Day gift to you, listeners. Like most Valentine's gift, you'll likely hate it. But there's Aww. no denying the love and the thought that went into it. <laughs> Joe, I'm assuming you've seen this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm familiar. I mean, you can tell that, Lance, that you really love your audience for this podcast because that is indeed a very, very nice pick for Valentine's Day for them. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah. Listen to Joe, everybody, and, and watch it before the next episode. All right. If you are not already, please give us a follow on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook, all at Unsung Horrors. Uh, you can follow me on Letterboxd under the username Also Watched. Uh, Lance, where can people find and follow you? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd at L Shibe. And Joe, where can people find and follow you? Agfa, Bleeding Skull, all the things. Um, Agfa and Bleeding Skull are both on Twitter and Instagram. Um, Bleeding Bleeding Skull is Bleeding bleeding underscore skull or something you can search for it mm-hmm. i'm not sure i remember um and then agfa is also i think it's film archive on on both um and then myself is uh, i'm just on twitter joseph aziemba on twitter um but i would also like to say um if you would be so kind and you would like to donate to agfa agfa is a nonprofit, and we would really appreciate it especially during pandemic times and you can uh, donate to agfa at americangenrefilm.com and we would appreciate it very much Yes. Yes. The link in show notes is not even going to go to the homepage of AGFA. It's going straight to the donate page, folks. So you can donate to AGFA. Uh, I'll post a, on Instagram a awesome t-shirt that I have from AGFA with the green slime that everyone should pick up as well. And you should definitely be following AGFA and Bleeding Skull. Check out all of their content and give them money, people, so they can keep bringing us awesome things like they are. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Joe, thank you once again so much for coming on and joining us and talking about Crystal Eyes. This has been a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for having me and asking me. And um, I really appreciate what you're doing because it's clear that you have a love for the movies. And like I said before, um, you're not treating them like they're jokes or they're something made fun of. And I think that there's such, uh, you know, there needs to be more of that in the world with appreciation for genre films. So keep doing what you're doing. Um, It's great. And thank you so much. I was very happy to be here. Yeah, Thank and you. speaking with you, Joe, makes me miss Terror Tuesday so damn much. So oh, man. I know, God. <laughs> me too. Thank you. Yeah, no, we'll be we'll be back. It'll be amazing someday. It's going to be great when when it when it all happens. It will. So, oh God. Okay. Before I start crying, guys, I'm just, I won't cry. I have one cry per year. I'm not, I'm not going to do. That. <laughs> I'm not going to do that in front of Lance. Okay. Well, thanks uh, to everyone for listening, and we will see you back next episode. Bye, everyone. Bye.